Good day, everybody, and welcome to Rocky Mountain Readings, where yesterday we finished uh, the wonderful book, Mystic Tales, from the Zohar, and uh, today we're going to get into something fresh, something new, uh, the Talmud, a biography, uh, banned, censored, and burned, the book they couldn't suppress. Uh, I thought that this would be an interesting uh, uh, read for B'nai Noach, uh, only because so many of them inquire, are we permitted to read the Talmud? Um, uh, and there's some mixed opinions, uh, and I think that the rabbi's positions are always one that uh, uh, tries to teach a student to approach uh, the sacred uh, with the right uh, intent and motive. And um, so this is why I thought I would read this book, because it's a biography. It's not reading the exact Talmud, but it's a biography of the Talmud. Uh, by a British writer, uh, Harry Friedman, uh, who's uh, got quite a good reputation. And I thought it would be a great introductory um, overview uh, for those that want to know what the Talmud is, uh, what it's about, what you could potentially draw from it, and uh, why you would even want to draw uh, from it, um, you know, rather than just... Uh, you know, blindly dive in and uh, uh, try to uh, study something that may not, in fact, be for you. So I thought it would be an awesome read. Uh, I think it's something that we can cover in a couple of weeks. It uh, sounds like uh, an interesting work. So uh, let's jump right in, and uh, we hope you all enjoy. Uh, nobody's given me any serious suggestions. So I thought, uh, you know, I did take the time to search and find something I thought might be uh, useful to B'nai Noach, and uh, yeah. Well, I'm still uh, fighting off the COVID, even though I'm feeling much better today than yesterday. Uh, I don't think I'm 100%, but uh, definitely uh, a little better uh, today than yesterday. So uh, let's jump right in and see how this goes. So um, hopefully you enjoy. Okay, we're going to start at the preface. Uh, this is the story of a book, a book which defines the religion of the Jews a book which arguably defines the Jews themselves. Most books don't have their own story. At best, they have a narrative about their publishing, history, and subsequent reception by the public. But the Talmud has more than just a story. It has a turbulent history, one which in many ways parallels the history of the Jewish people. The Talmud was composed as a record of discussions amongst scholars and sages in the ancient Jewish diaspora, in towns and villages close to Baghdad. As the Jews dispersed across the world, the Talmud went with them, traveling along trade and migratory routes into uh, the Maghreb, uh, Europe, Arabia, and the East. It became the foundation of the Jewish legal system, The most uh, uh, intractable of the Talmud's challenges came from the Jews themselves. Uh, rejectionists, messianic pretenders, and savants vilified it, seeking to delegitimize or at very least to minimize its influence. But like the Jews themselves, the Talmud's capacity for survival is boundless. Today, it is studied by more people than at any time in history. From one perspective, the Talmud story is a history of the Jews. From another, it is a window onto the development of world civilization. The history of the Talmud is a testament to what can happen, for better and for worse. When the literature of one culture comes into contact or conflict with the beliefs and values of another. Conversely, it illustrates the consequences for a self-contained inward-looking society when its defining texts are confronted by new ideas from the outside. The Talmud is a classic of world literature. It's a massive, ancient, and seemingly impenetrable work. People devote their lives to studying it, but you are not reading a book about what is in the Talmud. This is the story of what happened to the Talmud and the role it has played in world history, religion, and culture. It's not a book for experts or for specialists. It's a book for anyone who wants to know the story of one of the great classics of ancient literature. 
albeit one which is far less heavily thumbed outside of Jewish circles than Homer, uh, Chaucer, or Ovid. The content of the Talmud may be esoteric, but its history belongs to us all. Uh, for there are, is scarcely a square inch of the world's surface upon which its story was not, at some time, acted out. Introduction. What is the Talmud? Every nation has its laws. Few nations systematically records, record the process, the philosophical discussions and legal arguments which led to those laws. Everybody knows the laws are there for a reason, but the reasons don't make much difference to everyday life of most people. The Jews are different. As much value is attached to studying the process by which their laws emerged as to an awareness of the laws themselves. Shalom, Dave. Indeed, studying them is said to be more important than keeping them because studying them leads to keeping them. The Jews are known as the people of the book. Shalom, Sheila. But actually, they are the people of two books. The earlier book, the Hebrew Bible, is considered the sacred, revealed word of God. But the latter book, the man-made Talmud, is the more significant for understanding Judaism. The Hebrew Bible, uh, or some call the Old Testament, is the foundation of the Jewish religion. It is the basis of Jewish belief and the origin of its ethics, rituals, and social legislation. But the Bible deals in concepts, principles, and generalities. It rarely pronounces upon its injunctions in detail. The Talmud is a record of the discussions that took place over several centuries, which took the principles laid down in the Bible and gave the religion its form and shape. There is much in the Bible that has been ir irrelevant to religious practice for at least 2,000 years, including the system of sacrifices, uh, the treatment of unknown illnesses incorrectly referred to as leprosy, and many of the agricultural laws. Conversely, the Talmud contains vast amounts of material that may be based on the Bible, but it is not immediately evident in it, including discussions on the governance and regulation of society. The, the practical performance of religious rituals, family relationships, and contract and monetary law. It also contains much that is not in the Bible. Medicine, astronomy, folklore, magic, sex, and humor, to mention just a few. You had a hard time to get to this YouTube to post? Sheila, that's odd. The Talmud, the word means study or teaching, defines the Jewish religion. Aidan uh, Steinsaltz, perhaps the greatest commentator on the Talmud of her age, describes it as the central pillar supporting the entire spiritual and intellectual edifice of Jewish life. It is not an easy book. It is not an exquisitely complex, highly logical, and frequently impenetrable work. For most of it... <coughs> History, studying the Talmud, has been regarded by the Jews as an intellectual exercise in its own right, an exercise which, since it leads the student to the essence of human knowledge and experience, confers profound spiritual benefit. The Talmud is a massive work. It contains 1,800,000 words, spanning 37 volumes. Although it is concerned... Although it is concerned with law, it is not a law code. It is a record of discussions that took place in academies in Babylon between the 3rd and 5th centuries, discussions that were based on a book uh, called the Mishnah. Hmm. Okay, a second or, uh, to third century codification of Jew Jewish law. The Talmud was not written as a book. The people whose discussion it preserves had no idea that someone would come along generations later and edit them into a coherent work. A characteristic Talmudic discussion contains the opinions 
of people who may have lived centuries apart woven together to sound as if they are having an actual conversation. Modern editions of the Talmud are printed with dozens of commentaries. A typical edition takes up as much space on a bookshelf as a good encyclopedia. It is arcane and obscure, written as free-flowing prose with no uh, punctuation in two languages with traces of others which it mixes together and switches between unselfconsciously. Its logic is dense yet immaculate, It is more interested in the analysis of a problem than the outcome. That's something to keep in mind. It's more interested in the analysis of a problem than the outcome. Whereas many B'nai Noach ask questions looking for the the end result. Uh, They're always asking these questions of what's going to be the outcome from this, that, and the other thing, where it's the, you, under, you understand that they're, that's interested in, in the analysis of the problem. It frequently refrains from reaching a conclusion, and even when it does convey a decision, it can be hard to understand. The Talmud does have an overall structure, as, it, as does each of the topics it, it discusses, but its structure can be hard to discern, and the Talmud is capable of shooting off at tangents for pages on end before returning sometimes to the original topic. The traditional Talmud page doesn't look like the sort of book you are reading now. It's written in three main columns with additional material in both the left and right margins. Uh, The central column, which is in a, a bold typeface, contains the Talmud text itself. This column typically includes a few lines from the Mishnah on which the Talmud is commenting, followed by the Talmud itself. Of the three main columns, the one on the inside closest to the binding contains the commentary of Rashi, uh, the great 11th century French commentator. We will meet him in... uh, uh, in due benefit, but most Jews have never picked up a volume, let alone studied it. Serious Talmud study is an esoteric activity for people with scholarly or religious interest, a certain sort of mind and great powers of concentration. But just because few people have studied it doesn't mean that if they hear a sentence beginning with the words the Talmud says, they won't prick up their ears. There may be no desire or opportunity to study it, but people want to know what it says. It's that sort of book. The Talmud's story. 1900 years of history if we include the period during which the Talmud was being composed, is a lot to put into one book. If all the events and personalities in the Talmud history were included in it, it would end up as encyclopedia. My purpose in writing this biography is to provide a sense of the Talmud's vast and extensive extensive history, not to distill everything that happened into a single tome. Uh, The result is that some of the key events and locations have been covered in greater detail than others. A few important places, and unfortunately, uh, many important people have not been mentioned at all. My aim was to keep the story interesting and informative, even at the expense of comprehensiveness. A similar disclaimer applies to the scholars whom I have quoted in their research. There is much about the Talmud's history that scholars dispute particularly the question of who edited it and when, whether it was edited in its oral or written form, how it evolved from an oral composition to a written text, and just how fluid the content was while it was being transmitted. I haven't tried to present the views of every scholar, nor necessarily to follow the opinions of the greatest authorities in the field. I have tended to follow the research that best fits with the story I'm telling. Provided always that the research is credible and respected in academic circles. The fact that I have uh, cited some scholars and sources and not mentioned others does not reflect any particular preference or approval. It is simply the consequence of trying to distill such a large amount of history into a readable work. Much of what I have written will not be well received in traditional Talmudic circles. I have uh, approached the Talmud as world literature not as the exclusive property of the yeshiva. 
This is not a book for the Talmud scholar unless they are interested in the events surrounding the opus to which they have devoted their life. It is a book for those who want to know what the Talmud is and why the world would be greatly impoverished place without it. So there you go, folks. That's what we're going to get for it out of it. The book is for those who want to know what the Talmud is and why the world would be greatly impoverished place without it. I have tried to keep things as simple as possible in order that the story flows. So although this is a biography of the Babylonian Talmud, I have all the way through referred to it simply as the Talmud. There is, of course, another Talmud, the Yerushalayim or Jerusalem Talmud, and I do not touch on it. And I do touch on it from time to time. But for over a thousand years, the Babylonian Talmud has been the dominant and conventionally that is the one nearly everyone means when they talk about the Talmud. I've tried to minimize the use of non-English words that hasn't always been possible, particularly when referring to technical concepts or things that would require a full sentence to translate. The glossary at the back will help. Um, a word on terminology, the main body of the Talmud, that part which comments on the Mishnah is also known as the Gemara, an Aramaic word meaning teaching. The words Talmud and Gemara are synonymous and many people uh, prefer the latter term. The designation Gemara was introduced by medieval printers because the church censors had banned the, the use of the word Talmud. Yeah, lovely Christians, yeah. For simplicity, I have used the word Talmud throughout this book. References to the Babylonian Talmud in tractate and page only, the prefix is M and J, before tractate name refer to the Mishnah and the Jerusalem Talmud, respectively. A man asked a rabbi to teach him something of the Talmud. The rabbi refused. You haven't got a head for Talmud. The man persisted, so the rabbi asked him the following question. Two men fell down the same chimney. One came out clean and the other came out dirty. Which one went to wash? <coughs> the dirty one, of course, the man replied. No, said the rabbi. I knew you didn't have the head for Talmud. Now go away and leave me alone. Try me once more, pleaded the man. Just once more then, two men fell down the same chimney. One came out clean, the other came out dirty. Which one went to wash? The man thought for a moment, then grinned. The clean one. He looks at the dirty one and thinks he must be dirty too. Idiot, you have no head for Talmud. Leave me alone. The man was crestfallen. Try me one last time, please. One last time then. Two men fell down a chimney. One came out clean. The other came out dirty. Which one went to wash? He pondered hard. The clean one looks at the dirty one. He's looking at me, he thinks, and he's not washing, so he must think he's clean. So I must be clean, so neither of them wash. Moron, yelled the rabbi, how can you imagine that two men can fall down the same chimney and one come out clean and the other dirty? The Talmud in its world. In the beginning, why does every volume of the Talmud begin with page two and not page one? To teach us that no matter how much we learn, we have not yet reached the first page. Rabbi uh, Levi uh, Yitzhak of uh, Berdovich, Berdichev, White Rock Upon Black Fire. Round about three and a half thousand years ago, according to the book of Exodus, Moses descended from Mount Sinai carrying two tablets of stone. On it were engraved Ten Commandments. According to one legend, the commandments were written in white fire against a background of black fire. Another legend has it that the words were engraved right through the rock, yet the centers of the round letters, uh, which by rights should have fallen out, remain miraculously in place and the writing was legible from each side. These Ten Commandments were to become the centerpiece of the five books which Moses wrote during the 40 years that the Israelites wandered through the wilderness. 
the books became known as the Torah or teaching. The five books of Moses are amongst the most exalted works of world literature. <coughs> they contain stories that have inspired generations, proclaim religious and ethical teachings which spawned three great faiths, and lay out a complex system of legislation which was designed to animate the lives of the Israelite tribes for all eternity. But for all their grandeur, they are not easy books. The chronology can be confused. Sometimes it's hard to fathom out of sequence, out of the sequence in which events occurred. Most of the laws and regulations seem to be hazy. Invariably, they are not spelled out in enough detail. Several teachings appear distinctly cruel, even unethical to modern minds. Inspirational it may be, but the Torah often leaves its readers with more questions than answers. We find that often with B'nai Noach, they always got more questions. For example, the Torah instructs the Israelites to keep the Sabbath, but nowhere does it explicitly say how this is to be done. It speaks of husbands and wives, but it does not detail how a marriage ceremony is to be conducted, or indeed, if one is needed at all. It explains that the Israelites are merely leaseholders in the promised land, that the earth is Hashem's and Every 50 years, all property is to be returned to the families to whom it was originally given. But it offers no guidance on how the inevitable property disputes are to be resolved. Many modern scholars do not believe the Mount Sinai story, nor do they believe that Moses was the author of the Torah. Literary analysis of the text of the Torah suggests it was composed about two and a half to 3,000 years ago with material from several different sources woven into a more or less coherent whole. If that's so, it's not surprising that the book contains contradictions and repetitions. It's what one would expect from documents stitched together by ancient editors. But the origins of the Torah needn't concern us right now. For most of its history, until the 19th century, in fact, nobody doubted that the Torah was written by Moses in the wilderness, apart perhaps from the last few verses relating to his death. If there were any suspicion at all about its composition, it was whether Hashem had dictated the Torah for Moses to write down, or whether the Israelite leader had made it up. The Jews, without exception, held the first view. The Torah was the word of Hashem, prescribing the way they were to live their lives. Every single letter was significant. The Torah contained all the secrets of the universe. More than that, even according to some, it was the blueprint for the creation of the world. The mystics went as far as to claim that the Torah existed before the creation, that God consulted it when he formed the heavens and the earth. People likened the Torah to water. It was the source of life. It flowed everywhere. No earthly force could hold it back. <clears throat> and just as the flood covers the dry land beneath, so too the Torah conceals hidden depths of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. This meant that its inconsistencies and confusing passages would need to be resolved. People could only obey the, the frequent exhortations in the Torah that they live by its commandments if they knew what it, this entailed. It stood to reason that there had to be a system that would enable them to plumb the depths of the text, harmonize its wisdom, and fathom its contradictions. The interpretive tradition. To the believer, Moses' lack of detail is deliberate. The Torah is perfect by definition. It's inconceivable that it could be incomplete or lack key information. The reason why parts of it are hard to understand must be that the Torah deliberately challenges its readers to inquire more deeply, to reveal its concealed meaning, to use their God-given power of human knowledge and learning to decode the God-given text. So people began to study the Torah, seeking to uncover its hidden layers, trying to understand what Hashem really wanted from them. 
It wasn't just a question of understanding the laws. They hoped to become wiser and elevate themselves spiritually to become closer to their creator and discover eternal truth. The processes of interpreting the Torah is one of the longest continuous fields of human scholarly activity. Consider that, yeah. It has been going on for thousands of years. It has spawned a vast literary corpus uh, and a curriculum of study that is virtually unbounded. Uh, at the heart of this curriculum lies the Babylonian Talmud, a multi-volume compendium as big as an encyclopedia covering topics as diverse as law, faith, spirituality, folklore, medicine, magic, ethics, sex, relationship, humor, and prayers. It's called Babylonian because it was composed in Babylon, part of modern-day Iraq, between the 3rd and 6th centuries. The Babylonian Talmud has a lesser-known, slightly older cousin, the Jerusalem Talmud, which hailed from Roman-occupied Israel. Generally, when we talk about the Talmud, we mean the Babylonian version. The Talmud might look like a book, but it is far more than that. It's an institution. People devote their lives to studying it. No other book in history has made such demand of its readers. Its raison d'etre is to explain the Torah. But its explanations only raise more questions. It is not a linear work. It doesn't start with an introduction and build to a conclusion. That's something to keep in mind. It's not a linear work. It doesn't start with an introduction and build to a conclusion. You can open it anywhere, and you rarely have to turn back to find out what's been going on. It's often referred to as the Sea of Talmud, possibly because wherever you dive in, you're swimming. The Talmud is arcane and obscure. The Babylonian version is written in two languages, which it mixes together and moves between seamlessly. Its logic is dense. The arguments it puts forward are often perplexing. It presents arguments, but it is not preoccupied with finding solutions. <coughs> Equally, it's quite happy for a problem to have multiple solutions. These and these are the words of the living God. If the Torah raised questions, the Talmud raises questions about questions. And yet... For all that, or perhaps because of it, no other book in the world has had a comparable history. A history that's not always been happy, but a history which leaves us wondering almost as much about the book itself as the material it contains. It's more a biography than a history, really. Not so much the story of a book as the story of a life. The oral law. Most of the Talmud is based on a record of discussions held in the rabbinic academies in Babylon between the years 230 and 500 CE. Perhaps calling it a record is a bit misleading because the discussions are not set out formally. Subject um, by subject, speaker by speaker, it's nothing like Han Hansard or the congreg congressional record which give precise accounts of who said what and when and in a debate. Instead, the Talmud tends to weave several topics together, skipping seamlessly from one to the other, creating conversations between people who live generations apart, switching languages as it goes from Hebrew to Aramaic and back again with a few Greek words thrown in, fabricating a complex web of hypothesis, rejection, argument, and counter-argument. It is a perplexing, confusing, and rigorously logical work. It takes nothing for granted and is not satisfied with anything less than absolute certainty. The heart of the Talmud is an earlier work known as the Mishnah. Mishnah literally means repetition, both because it was taught through verbal repetition and because it repeats and explains the laws in the Torah. The Mishnah sort, sorts the laws in the Torah into topics and clarifies them, generally by giving short practical examples. The book we call the Talmud is made up of short snatches from the Mishnah with commentary in between. 
The commentary can be quite lengthy and shoots off at all sorts of tangents, making it easier to forget what was being commented on in the first place. One of the sections of the Mishnah is called the Chapters of the Fathers, the Ethics of the Fathers, and that's a class I do on uh, Saturday with Rabbi Chaim Kaufman. Uh, we'll be on this weekend as well. Uh, we're doing uh, Chapter 2, Mishnah uh, 9, Part 5. It's unusual title. There are 63 sections in the Mishnah, and apart from this one, they are all named after legal or religious topics, like betrothals, uh, vows, or blessings. But Chapters of the Fathers is not about legal matters at all. In fact, it's not really clear why it was included in the Mishnah. It's a collection of motivational statements, ethical urgings, and life advice from rabbis who lived during the first and second centuries. In modern terms, it's like a collection of sound bites from leading business gurus, political orators, celebrity preachers, and media personalities. Chapter Ethics of the Fathers is, begins like this. Moses received the Torah on Mount Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets handed it down to the men of the great assembly. It's a simple statement, and its meaning is quite obvious. The trouble is, it doesn't fit with what the Torah itself says. The Torah is a text for people who, uh, for the people, it says so, so quite clearly. Moses was instructed to teach the Torah to the children of Israel. It's a public document, the heritage of every Israelite. It's not some arcane knowledge to be handed down in secret across the generations through a succession of dignitaries to the men of the great assembly, whoever they were. And this is where the story of the Talmud has its first encounter with politics, because the Torah that Moses transmitted to Joshua and so on is not the Torah that God instructed Moses to write in the wilderness. The Torah that contains the Ten Commandments, it's another Torah altogether. It is, in fact, which a Torah which explains the other Torah. It's enough to make your head spin, isn't it? According to Jewish belief, there are two Torahs, not one. One was dictated by God to Moses in the wilderness, placed into a wooden chest overlaid with gold in the sacred tabernacle in the wilderness, transferred in due course to the Jerusalem temple and copied by scribes onto parchment scrolls that today reside in places of worship. When people talk about the Torah, that's the one they mean. But the other Torah wasn't written down. It was delivered verbally by Moses, or to Moses by God, for him to transmit by word of mouth to his successor Joshua, who in turn would pass it on, just as it says in the Ethics of the Fathers. Uh, this second unwritten Torah explains and clarifies the public Torah with which God dictated to Moses. It still sounds a bit like a power play, doesn't it? Moses is given some arcane knowledge which only the leaders of the people have access to. Whoever has it passes it to his successor. All the leaders were men. We don't hear of anyone disclosing it to the ordinary people. In the sections of the Bible that follow, the five books of Moses, which covers centuries of Israelite history, there is no mention of it. The first we hear of it is uh, chapters of the fathers about a thousand years after Moses received it. It's the stuff of blockbuster movies, the secrets of power handed down directly by all the all-powerful to his representatives on earth to be used to interpret the law to suit the needs of a powerful elite. But it doesn't mean that at all. The very fact that the chapters of the fathers mentions the transmission of this Torah, the oral Torah, as it became known, confirms that its existence was not meant to be secret. On the contrary, the verbally communicated Torah is as public as the written Torah. It was simply entrusted to the leaders of the people to ensure it was handed down and not forgotten. It was essential that it did not become lost. It was the key to the written Torah. It was needed to decode all the written Torah's apparent contradictions and inconsistencies. The oral Torah is the guide to the written Torah, and it was the duty of leaders to preserve and transmit it. But to ensure that ordinary people were aware of its importance, its existence was publicized in the Ethics of the Fathers. 
uh, that at least is the religious view. It's not the only one. To understand the politics of this, we have to go back to the period roughly 100 BC to 100 CE. The world was rapidly modernizing. New trade routes were opening up. The Roman Empire was facilitating communication between remote places. Merchants, armies, and civil administrators were coming and going. Change was in the air. New ideas were beginning to circulate. The world was becoming globally connected in an ancient sort of way. Like many Mediterranean lands, the Israelite nation was under Roman rule. Life was hard, people were poor, apart from the ruling elite, and generally demoralized. Bands of partisans would spring up from time to time, roaming the countryside and launching occasional attacks on the Romans, but most people were too busy trying to scrape a meager existence together to bother to become heroes. Jerusalem was the religious and political capital of the Jewish nation. Power resided in its temple, which the Roman puppet king Herod was restoring to undreamed of magnificence. But the priests who ran the temple and most of the judges who sat in the Sanhedrin, which was both the Supreme Court and the legislature, were part of a partisan sect in Jewish society known as the Sadducees. The Sadducees had done well under Roman occupation, and many of the ordinary people resented their wealth and privilege. The people found they had much more in common with a group of pious scholars who observed conditions of strictly ritual purity, abstaining uh, from forbidden foods and distancing themselves from objects that Moses had declared impure because they carried a taint of death or decay. They called themselves Pharisees or separatists. In due course, their leaders would go by the title rabbi or teacher. As their support grew amongst the working classes, the scholars found their political voice. Their leaders started to vie for influence in the temple and the Sanhedrin. In the, uh, yeah, Their numbers and popularity grew, and the ruling classes could no longer ignore them. The Pharisees saw things differently from the Sadducees. The written Torah had given the priests privileges, which had enabled many of them to grow wealthy and complacent. The Pharisees argued that these privileges were being abused, that the written Torah had been misinterpreted. They quoted teachings that had been handed down by word of mouth, teachings that regulated the power of the priests, teachings to which the Sadducees paid no attention. The Pharisees argued that these words of mouth traditions had the full authority of law, that they were, in fact, an unwritten oral Torah. Very important statements. It's not clear whether the Pharisees had always believed that their oral traditions were given to Moses on Mount Sinai or whether this was a latter idea which gained currency because it gave their uh, position more legitimacy. The historical view is that the oral Torah developed organically through family and social traditions. And connecting it with Moses was just a device to give it authority. Wow. The origins of the Talmud. Uh, Rabbi Ilya said, uh, by three things may a person's character be determined by his drinking and spending habits, and by his anger. Some say also by his laughter. The destruction of the temple. The struggle for religious power between Pharisees and Sadducees continued until the year 70 CE. By this time, the military situation in the land had completely deteriorated. Guerrilla groups were launching attacks on the Romans on a daily basis. The mighty Roman legions had suffered considerable setbacks. The empire decided it was time to flex its muscle. Roman forces uh, besieged Jerusalem, starved the population into submission, then burnt down the city and destroyed the temple. It's, it is hard for us 2,000 years and as many miles away to grasp the full impact of this event. Disease and famine having already decimated the population, Ben Zakai pleaded with the militants guarding the city gates to allow him to leave and negotiate a surrender. The militants would have none of it. Ben Zakai was the leader of the peace camp and the confrontational militants were diametrically opposed to everything he stood for. 
However, the leader of the militants, a man called Abba Asikra, or Red Father, just happened to be Ben Zakai's nephew. He vowed to help his uncle slip past the gatekeepers and reach the Roman camp. Abba Sikra told the rabbi to climb into a coffin, play dead, and get his students to carry him out of the city on a pretense that he was being taken for burial. Uh, Abba Sikra then made sure that the guards let the coffin through with the appropriate amount of respect. Out, once outside the city walls, Ben Zakai climbed out of the coffin and went to see the Roman commander, probably Titus, although the legend says it was his father Vespasian. <coughs> According to uh, the legend, Ben Zakai, knowing that the city would fall, performed some minor miracles which endeared him to the Roman commander and allowed him to negotiate the safe passage of the Pharisee rabbis and their students out of Jerusalem. Titus granted him a refuge in Yavne, a small town in the southwest of the country. The Roman authorities probably didn't think much about this. They couldn't imagine that giving a refuge, refuge to uh, Yonahan ben Zakai, his colleagues and students, would be of any great consequence. After all, a bunch of holy men and scholars could hardly present a threat to the rampant Roman Empire. Had they thought it through, though, the Romans could have saved themselves a century or more of trouble. If they'd only realized that Ben Zakai and his colleagues were about to do were about to do for the national morale and the faith of the Jews. The destruction of the temple was a tragedy for the nation, but the, for the Sadducees, some good came out of it. The Sadducees no longer had their power base, and their priestly allies had virtually no role at all, since the whole of their religious mission had been to conduct the services in the temple. The Yavne, in Yavne, the Pharisees were faced with a stark reality. Unless they could find a way to save religion, the religion that now lacked its temple and sacrificial cult, the civil, their civilization would disappear. The proud, independent Israelite culture with its rich biblical and prophetic heritage could would be eradicated, their people would become just another subjugated nation under the Roman thumb. The tools the Pharisees had at their disposal uh, were the written Torah, the oral traditions, and their perfect faith. That was enough. Under uh, Jonathan ben Zakai's leadership, the Pharisees were about to set in place a process that would eventually result in the composition of the Talmud and 2,000 years of unbroken study. The Vineyard at Yavne. The academy that uh, Jonathan ben Zakai established it, at Yavne was known as the Vineyard. Uh, it's not clear why. It's possible that the discussions took place in a field amongst grapevines or that whatever building they had were erected on the site of an old vineyard. One theory, however, has it that the scholars sat in rows, planted and fruitful, uh, just like grapevines. Uh, according to the Ethics of the Fathers, after the men of the Great Assembly received the Oral Law from the prophets, they passed it into a pair of scholars who passed it on to another pair and so on for five generations. The names of the fifth pair were Hillel and Shammai. Um, and although they were, along, they were long dead by the time of the vineyard was established, their respective students would have been amongst those who sat in rows in the Academy of Yavne. It is said of Shammai that a non-Jew approached him and offered to convert to Judaism if he could be taught the whole of the Torah while he stood on one leg. Obviously, it was an impossible request, and Shammai angrily drove him away. The man then approached Hillel and made the same proposal. Hillel replied, That which is hateful to you do not do to your fellow. The rest is commentary. Go and learn. Shammai, who is also credited with saying, greet everyone cheerfully, was no doubt having a bad day. Hillel and Shammai held differing views on many issues, but the things they disagreed about are less important than the fact that they disagreed. Indeed, their disagreements were considered by the scholars in the vineyard to, to be not just valid, but essential. So you see the way they look at it, I mean, we're... Too often today, people see argument as problem. These folks began to see it as, wait a second, this is, uh, you know, igniting a sparks that we can, you know, develop uh, true understanding from. For 300 years, there was a dispute between Hillel students and Shammai students, the former asserting 
the law is in agreement without our views, the latter claiming the laws are in agreement with our views. Then a voice from heaven announced, these and these are the words of the living God. Nothing illustrates the process of Talmudic debate better than the fact that the different opinions can each be the words of the living God. Well, this should do away with tunnel vision thinking. You'll be shocked how many people got to be right, and that means everybody else is wrong that doesn't agree. And you know, so many people get that way, and uh, yeah. Even though the Talmud is concerned with laws, behaviors, and belief, it's less interested in reaching conclusions than in presenting different ways of looking at a problem. Very, very, very important. So this is why you get a certain responses from rabbis, okay? Ask a question, they ask a question back because they're trying to teach you to look at different ways of looking at a problem. It's not so much, so much the final decision that counts as the process which leads to it. The discussions at the vineyard were not recorded in writing, and anything we know about it comes from sources written long after. It's clear that the immediate priority for Yochanan ben Zakai and his colleagues uh, was to make sure that their knowledge of Torah and its oral interpretations didn't get lost in all the national turmoil and upheaval. The vineyard was the forum for... trans Torah. If the law that Moses had written in the wilderness couldn't be interpreted in such a way as to underpin a point of view, it wasn't accepted. The key topic was how to deal with rituals that used to be performed in the temple. Animal sacrifices had to be ab- had been abolished altogether. The Torah had been confined, the offering of them to the temple, but many rituals had not involved sacrifices, and the Pharisees believed in making the religion open to everyone. So wherever they could, uh, Yochanan ben Zakai and his colleagues instituted new procedures that allowed ordinary people to perform those rituals that had once been in the exclusive domain of the temple. But the most important task for all the rabbis in the vineyard was to inspire, enthuse, and motivate their demoralized and traumatized nation, to encourage people to reconnect with a faith which seemed to have failed them so badly. In doing this, they demonstrated a remarkable aptitude for creativity. Just as Moses, Torah had had woven together stories, laws, and grand ideas, so too the Yavne scholars engaged in in, in flights of imagination, illustrating their ideas with parables, folktales, and imagery. On the day that Rabbi Eliezer brought forward every imaginable argument, but the other scholars did not accept them, He said, if the law agrees with me, let this carob tree prove it. Thereupon, the carob tree was torn a hundred cubits out of its place. No proof can be brought from a carob tree, they retorted. Again, he said of them, if the law agrees with me, let the stream of water prove it. Whereupon, the stream of water flowed backwards. No proof can be brought from a stream of water, they rejoined. Again, he urged, if the law agrees with me, let the walls of the study house prove it. Whereupon the walls began to incline, but the rap, but Rabbi Yoshua uh, rebuked the walls, saying, when scholars are engaged in a legal dispute, what right have you to interfere? So they did not fall in honor of Rabbi Joshua, nor did they resume. <coughs> upright, in honor of Rabbi Eliezer, and they are still leaning to this day. Again, he said to them, if the law agrees with me, let it be proven from heaven, whereupon a heavenly voice cried out, why do you dispute with Rabbi Eliezer, seeing that in all matters the law agrees with him? But Rabbi Joshua arose and exclaimed, the Torah is not in heaven. Uh, What did he mean by this, said Rabbi Jeremiah, that once the Torah had already been given at Mount Sinai, we pay no attention to a heavenly voice, because it also says in the Torah, you shall follow the majority view. Very important. They follow the majority view, but only for good. You you don't follow the majority for wicked. Keep that in mind at all times, folks, you know. Um, 
And that's why they had their Sanhedrin and they had a ruling body and uh, the majority of the decision. Uh, and they had rules. If, if it was a, um, if it was a, a, a capital crime and uh, death was the potential sentence, if they, the, everybody agreed 100% that the guy was guilty, the guy was set free because they, they, they held that there was absolutely no way everybody could be 100% uh, in agreement um, of guilt. Uh, that's, that's where tunnel vision starts to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, criminalize. Um, yeah, so uh, you got to keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Recording the oral law. The following century was amongst the most tumultuous in Jewish history. A series of rebellions by the Jews led to harsh reprisals by the Romans. The fighting uh, reached ahead in 132 BCE when a band of guerrillas under the leadership of Bar Chokba staged a successful revolt, put the Romans to flight, and declared an independent Jewish state. It didn't last long, though. Three years later, the revolution was over and the Jews were subjugated once again. A harsh period of intense religious and personal persecution orchestrated by the Roman Emperor Hadrian began. Traumatic social and political conditions make it difficult to preserve oral traditions. Yeah, millions of them were, were killed at that under Hadrian's reign because of their... Uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt around the 130 to 135 uh, AD. You got to, you know, look at that closely and you see how many millions they were hunted into the, uh, into the, the, the wilderness. Um, yeah. And so you got the traumatic social and political conditions make it difficult to preserve oral traditions. People move around, communications become difficult. Things get forgotten or misrepresented at the same time. The vineyard had experienced, expanded far beyond its original borders. It had spawned a generation of major scholars who were now dotted all over the country, teaching when they could, but mainly in hiding from the Romans. The sheer volume of material that had been taught since the opening of the vineyard and the difficult conditions under which it was now being disseminated meant that the oral tradition was tottering. The rabbis began to realize that they would need to commit their teachings to writing if they didn't, they, they, they may be lost. So gradually, written codifications of the oral law began to emerge. We don't know who started the process of writing down the oral law. One theory is that its recording began on the day that uh, Eliezer ben Azaria was appointed as the head of the academy in place of the hereditary leader, Rebbe Gamaliel II, the grandson of Hillel and grandson of Paul's supposedly teacher Gamaliel I. Gamaliel had inherited the title of Nasi from his father, literally meaning prince. The Nasi was the leader of the rabbinic community. Hillel um, had been the first Nasi. The title was granted to him in recognition of his scholarship. The title was hereditary, which reflected uh, the fact that the, the Nasi could uh, trace the descent back to King David. But although he was called a prince, and had formal contacts with the Roman authorities, he didn't have a royal lifestyle in the sense we would think of today. Gamaliel II was a, a, a severe but probably quite insecure leader. Like many weak men, he tried to impose his will even at times when it would have been political for him to hold back. He often found himself in conflict with the other senior rabbis, notably Rabbi Joshua, on one notable occasion, he publicly humiliated Joshua by ordering him to remain on his feet whilst he sat and taught. The other rabbis who had enough of his autocratic behavior took the unprecedented decision to depose him and appoint uh, Eliezer, Eliezer ben Azaria in his place. On that day, on that day uh, that Eliezer was appointed, according to Talmudic account, the gates of the academy were thrown open and up to 700 new students who had not matched up to Gamaliel's strict admission criteria were admitted. Any law about which uh, there was a doubt was apparently discussed on that day, clarified and codified into a collection known as the Eduyot, or Testimonies. 
Diot, which was uh, later absorbed into the Mishnah, contains a vast number of laws, and it is probably an exagger exaggeration to say that they were all clarified in one day. But the deposing of Rabbi Gamaliel II towards the end of the first century seems to have heralded a sea change, uh, which not only expanded the academy, but also began the process of crystallizing and recording legal decisions. Gamaliel's office was held in high respect by the scholars. They didn't want to de depose him permanently, but he could not be reinstated until he apologized to Rabbi uh, Joshua. This he agreed to do. As he entered Joshua's hovel, no more than a simple clay brick structure within an earthen floor, with an earthen floor and timber strewn roof, roof, he saw that the walls were black. It seems to me that, said Gamaliel, that you are a charcoal burner. Joshua, no doubt, raising his eyes to heaven, replied, Alas, for the generation of which you are a leader, seeing that you know nothing of the troubles of, this, of the scholars, their struggles to support and sustain themselves. Even after he had apologized, it wasn't easy to restore Gamaliel to his office. Many of the scholars objected, not just because they didn't want Gamaliel back, but also because of the sight, slight they, they thought this would cast on Eliezer Ben Azaria, who had succeeded him. It fell to a younger colleague, Rabbi Akiva, to propose a solution through which they would share the office. Very important. Akiva is best known uh, and most highly regarded of all rabbis. Legends and stories about him abound. Unfortunately, this mis makes it hard to know the, his true life history, which is concealed somewhere beneath layers of folklore and fable. We do know that he was amongst the first to systematically compile and classify the oral law. We know this because in a small number of places, the Mishnah itself quotes an earlier work, which it either calls the Mishnah of Rabbi Akiva or the first Mishnah. Akiva, it is said to have started life as a shepherd with no education. He worked for a very wealthy man and fell in love with his daughter, Rachel. Rachel. Uh, her father was uh, resolutely opposed to the match, but Rachel was unwilling to run away with uh, Akiva on the condition. She was willing to run away with Akiva on the condition that he immediately went off to get himself an education. Akiva jumped at her suggestion and went to the vineyard or one of its offshoots for 12 years. On his return, he overheard an old man asking his wife how long she would endure the life of a widow. If I had my way, she replied, he would stay for 12 more years. Akiva promptly turned around and went back. Uh, when he finally came home, according to this tale, he was accompanied by 24,000 students. Although Akiva's life story is cloaked by legend and hyperbole, we get a good idea of his character and intellect from his teaching and legal rulings. As his 20th century biographer put it, Akiva ranks in depth of intellect, breadth of sympathy, and clarity of vision with the foremost personalities of the Hebrew tradition, Moses and Isaiah amongst the prophets, Maimonides, uh, Crescus, and Spinoza amongst the philosophers. He dominates the whole scene of Jewish history from the period of the second, of second Isaiah, about 540 B.C., until the rise of the Spanish schools of the philosophers at about 1100 C.E. Akiva never forgot his humble origins. Time and again, his interpretation of the oral law reflects a concern for the poor and needy, for example, upholding the right of impoverished farmers to inherit tiny parcels of land which his uh, wealthier colleagues consider too small for the law to concern itself. When the temple had stood and the Levites were unable to earn a living because of their official duties, they had been compensated by a system of tithes, each farmer giving a tenth of his crop. Now that the temple had been destroyed and small farm, farmers were struggling to survive, Akiva put in place measures which effectively abolished the system, obligating the Levites to become economically independent. On another occasion, he limited the exclusive rights of priests to eat the flesh of a firstborn lamb that was unfit to be sacrificed, ruling that anyone 
Israelite or not, may eat of it. But he did not allow his sympathy for the poor to override his belief in the integrity of the law. When his colleague Tarfun, a wealthy olive farmer, tried to introduce a humanitarian solution to a dispute between various creditors over who could seize the land of someone who had died, Akiva protested. Tarfun had wanted to give the land to the poorest claimant. No, argued Akiva, the law is not charity. The land must be given to the deceased's heirs. In a similar vein, if two people found themselves stranded in a desert with only enough water for one of them to survive, Akiva argued that they shouldn't share it, otherwise they would just watch each other die. Saving life is important. Yeah, this is a huge concept. Saving life is important, but it is not right to sacrifice two lives when one can be saved. This is such a concept. Nor should the owner of the water sacrifice his life for his companion. Akiva quoted Leviticus 25.36, that thy brother shall live with you, emphasizing the word with, to infer that in such a case, your life takes precedence over your companion's. Akiva found himself caught up in the ongoing struggle against Rome. His involvement be began around the year 95 when a distinguished Roman and member of the emperor's family, Flavius uh, Clemens, converted to Judaism. This so enraged the em emperor that he planned a series of punitive measures against the Jews. Akiva... Uh, joined a diplomatic mission to Rome along with Gamaliel, Joshua, and uh, Eliezer uh, ben Azaria to try to assuage the emperor's wrath. As relations with Rome worsened, Akiva declared his support for the Jewish rebel Shimon Bar Kokhba. Uh, when Bar Kokhba won his improbable and short lived victory, Akiva proclaimed him to be the Messiah. This was a rare lapse of judgment on Akiva's part as he realized when the rebel state was ultimately defeated in a period of merciless brutality, which history would name the Hadrianic persecutions began, the practice of the Jewish faith was banned, and Akiva, whose whole life had been dedicated to Torah study, found himself at the head of a religious resistance movement. When a colleague, Pappas, uh, castigated himself for teaching Torah in public, Akiva responded with a parable. He told of the fox who tried to persuade a fish that he could be saved from the fisherman's nets if he would only come live with him on the dry land. The fish replied that if he could, if he could not be safe in his natural environment, he would certainly not be safe in an unnatural space. So it is with us, said Akiva, if we are not safe in the Torah, which is our natural condition, how can we be safe elsewhere? Shortly afterwards, Akiva was captured and imprisoned by the Romans. He was put to death in the year 135 CE, defiantly proclaiming the words of the Shema, the Jewish declaration of faith, while the Romans tore his flesh from him with iron combs. The Mishnah. Akiva may have been dead, but his reputation and authority lived on through his students. Led by his pupil Mir, uh, they continued uh, his work of recording the oral law, compiling collections of laws and arranging them in topics, almost certainly using the same arrangement that Akiva used for his earlier Mishnah. If Mir had followed the style of the five books of Moses and simply written down the laws, albeit in greater detail, the Talmud would never have been conceived. He would have created a rule book and nothing more, but it was Mir's great genius to preserved the fluidity of the oral tradition by recording not only the official majority rulings, but also the views of those who disagreed. And that's one thing to keep in mind. <laughs> if you're ever going to glance at Talmud, you're not only getting the, the, the majority rulings in it, you're getting the disagreements. And um, if you get lost in it, uh, you're not going to draw uh, what needs to be drawn. And, and um, 
Yeah, it's just like the book of uh, Job. Uh, when you hear his friends chat with him, they all start to sound so right when you're three, ch- three chapters into one guy arguing. You know, his logic sounds so crystal clear. But in reality, you know, it was rebuked by Hashem in the end. Today, when several judges sit together on a case, it is usual for each of them to give their opinion, even if they disagree with the majority verdict. Mir's Mishnah did the same thing, except the opinions were condensed into three or four words, not paragraphs or pages. Mir's was the work of a lifetime. It fell to one of his younger colleagues, a descendant of Hillel and Gamaliel, to undertake the final stage in the creation of the Mishnah. Rabbi uh, Judah the Nasi, often known uh, just as Rabbi, collated and edited the Mishnah of Akiva in Mir. He adopted a practice introduced by Mir of using a- anonymous opinions to indicate his teacher's view. And this is why they, they consider when you see something cited by, uh, uh, quoted by uh, Rabbi Mir, uh, it's often an unknown source, but uh, it's in his teacher's opinion. It's something that uh, the Judah Hanasi would have written down uh, because it was taught to him, uh, and it might be ascribed to Rabbi Mir because he was his teacher, um, but it may, in fact, have an unknown source. And so rabbis know that when they hear it's uh, Rabbi Mir used to teach, uh, and then a statement, uh, they, they know it could be from a much older source um, that wasn't transmitted. Um uh, but it came from his teacher uh, to him. So, okay, in Ju- let's see. Mir had expressed Akiva's opinion anonymously in Judah's mission. Mishnah and the anonymous voice belonged to Mir. So this is what he was talking about. Yeah, in, yeah. However, in most cases, Judah gave Mir's view anonymously as if it was generally accepted as the authoritative ruling. Otherwise, he would clearly state that it was Mir's opinion. The opening chapter of Rabbi Judah's Mishnah gives a good illustration of how this worked. The Torah had ordained that a passage known as the Shema, which declares God's unity, should be read when you lie down and when you rise up. But it also says the Shema should be said when you sit in your house and when you walk down the road. Unless they had clearer guidelines as to when they should say it, people would be reciting the Shema all day long. Think about this, right? That's exactly what the Torah says. You should do it when you're, you know, when you rise, uh, um, when you lie down and when you rise up, but also when you sit in your house and when you walk down the road. People would be doing it all day long if there was no clarification. Um, Yeah. The Mishnah rules that the Shema would be said twice a day and wants to know how this operates in practice. From what time can one read the Shema in the morning? From the time that one can distinguish between blue and white, Rabbi Eliezer said between blue and green, and until sunrise, Rabbi Joshua said until the third hour, for it is the practice of kings to arise at the third hour. This passage contains three opinions. The first one, from the time that one can distinguish between blue and white, is anonymous, The others are attributed to Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Joshua. The anonymous opinion reflects Rabbi Mir's view based on what he learned from his teacher Akiva. By giving it anonymously, uh, Rabbi Judah the Nasi is flagging up that this is the view to follow. When Judah finished his Mishnah, the process of recording the oral law was nearly at an end. The Mishnah became accepted as authentic, comprehensive, and authoritative. Indeed, in some circles, studying Rabbi's Mishnah was so holy a task, it became an acceptable substitute for the now defunct sacrifices. Whoa. Very important. Although the Mishnah, which has come down to us today, is Rabbi Judah's work, it contains the names of several people who lived after him. It even mentions his death. Clearly, some editing work has been done to the Judas Mishnah even after he had finished it. Indeed, Rabbi Hia 
one of uh, his pupils is said to have had a secret scroll which contained emendations to the min- to the Mishnah. The prevailing view today is that it took some time for the Mishnah to become accepted as authoritative. It seems that once the Mishnah was complete, people in different parts of the Jewish world deliberately edited the text to fit with a tradition they believed is, was more authentic. This explains why there is more than one version of the Mishnah, even though the differences between the versions are very slight. Unlike Torah, you need to understand, Torah is preserved textually uh, with the Ratbash uh, cipher. Uh, Mishnah was not, though any deviation is very slight. And it's the difference of uh, uh, command to preserve uh, versus honor to preserve. Yeah, it was only gradually as the authority of the Mishnah became established that people fade, fiddled with the, with the less text. When he compiled the Mishnah, Judah had to decide what to include and what to omit. Much of what was left out was collected together in a compendium uh, called the Tosefta. Thought thought to have been compiled by Rabbi He, a Judah student who kept the secret scroll. The Tosefta is structured in the same way as the Mishnah, although the Talmud is a commentary on the Mishnah. It often quotes from the Tosefta. as well as from other collections of material dating from the same period. The Mishnah is a standalone work that's often read independently of the Talmud. It's systematic, terse, and direct in its language, although as we have seen, it offers different points of view as to what the law may be. Unlike the Talmud, it does not create debates or conversations. It simply records facts and moves on. I love the ethics coming out of that. And Rabbi Kaufman, I mean, we've had as many as 22 episodes on one Mishnah. Uh, They just unfurl like that. And uh, yeah. But laws, beliefs, and rituals are complex things. There is plenty of opportunity to explore and interpret the principles that lie behind the bare rulings that the Mishnah states. And just as Moses' Torah became an object of study and interpretation... So did the Mishnah. In fact, it wasn't until the Mishnah was finished and was being circulated amongst the study houses in Israel and Babylon that the story of the Talmud really began. <laughs> and you know what, folks? I think you know maybe we can uh, stop there for today and um, we'll aim to come back with this. Um, how are you guys enjoying uh, uh, the biography here uh, on the Talmud? Getting you some background, you learning something about what it really is, where its origins came from, and how it began to develop. And I'm sure we're going to get into some beautiful material. Um, golden nuggets, I'm sure, will start to drop out of it uh, later on in the book. Uh, it's something that I think is going to take us about uh, uh, probably six to eight sessions to finish this work. Um, so hopefully you'll hang in there with me uh, here on Rocky Mountain Readings. I think this is fascinating because it gives us a lot of background, uh, a lot of history, and a lot of understanding of the context or the setting. Uh, I love how they touched on you know the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt, the, 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 what the Jews were going through. You must understand the temple was destroyed, uh, and if it wasn't for the establishment of the vineyard there at Yavne, the... Uh, the 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 um, yeshiva at Yavne, uh, which they nicknamed the Vineyard. Um, if it wasn't for that, uh, Judaism may not have survived. But um, the the Sadducees, you know, fell by the wayside with the destruction of the temple because that's where their their whole structure, uh, their whole. Uh, all that they were was intertwined with, intertwined with the politics and trying to be the ruling elite, which uh, didn't account for the real needs of the people. And uh, the Pharisees kept uh, in touch with that and wanted to keep alive and preserve the, the, the essence of what the Torah was. And 
uh, the teachers in Yavne preserved the Judaism uh, that we have today, uh, and it spread. And uh, but then, you know, sixty years after the destruction of the temple, you end up at the the Bar Chokba revolts, which um, Rabbi Akiva had pronounced him as the Messiah uh, because he had, had gained a certain degree of military restoration. Uh, but the Romans fought back. Hadrian uh, just decimated the Jewish people after that, and uh, millions died as, as we have saw different persecutions um, over the millennia, the last two millennia. I mean, they, they, they speculate that um, almost as many Jews perished during Hadrian's uh, as with Hitler, uh, Yamak Shemova. He may, yeah, Zikra, he may uh, be uh, forgotten. And the reality is um, nobody wants to, to, to see this ever again happen to the Jewish people. May they be established in their land. Um, may Hashem just uh, 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 open the opportunity for the third temple and uh, may Mashiach uh, be established in our days. Uh, but I hopefully you guys get some... Uh, 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 precious understanding of what the Talmud is, how it's laid out, what it's do, its its intent is, and what you can draw from it. Uh, because uh, uh, I know Rabbi Singer had put a video out there that you know Noahides could study Talmud, especially the the part of it that's relevant for them. But how do you know what's relevant to you if you don't start diving into and knowing where to go? I think that this book, a uh, biography, will help give us a an overview. Uh, of what the material is, and uh, I always uh, tell B'nai Noach to cleave onto the, the hem of a, a rabbi's garment so that you've got a, uh, a, um, a clear definition of when you can, uh, when you need an answer, um, you've got a source that you can lean on. So when it comes to study of Talmud, I, I, I I recommend you don't do any su- any such thing without uh, uh, your rabbi's direct permission. Um, yeah, always to be safe. So, you know, uh, I think we're going to call it uh, a day for Rocky Mountain readings today, but hopefully you're enjoying this book, uh, The Talmud, uh, a biography, and we'll be back on Tuesday, I'm aiming. I've got to work all weekend. Uh, Hashem willing, uh, I'm not infectious with this COVID, uh, um, and... Uh, I'm going to go into work uh, tonight and all weekend and uh, um, Hashem willing, uh, everything goes well. And uh, uh, so we'll be back Tuesday with more of the Talmud, a biography. And I am on this uh, uh, Saturday after uh, Shabbat, Shabbat in Israel with Rabbi Kaufman. Uh, nobody else this weekend. I believe the following week I'll be back with Rabbi Post and hopefully uh, with more of Tomer Devora, uh, and then also Rabbi Goldberg and uh, Rabbi uh, um, Carmi Ingber out of Atlanta, Georgia, such a champ. Uh, opening Q and A with our friends over at Nativ, just beautiful, beautiful material with uh, Rabbi Ingber always. Anyways, I'm going to sign out for today. Have a great day, Shabbat Shalom this uh, week, folks, and uh, we'll see you next time on Rocky Mountain Readings. Bye for now. Right.